Welcome to Marketing Blabs. This podcast is brought to you by Marketing Labs, an expert digital marketing agency based in Nottinghamshire. If you're a business owner or marketing professional looking for straightforward, non-salesy tips and advice to help grow your business online, then this podcast is for you. Strap in because we're about to reveal the things that other agencies would rather you didn't know. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Marketing Blabs podcast. I'm your host, Tilly Hayes, and I'm the SEO exec here at Marketing Labs. Paid social media has become an essential component of any digital marketing strategy. With the ever-changing algorithms and increasing competition, it's more important than ever to understand how to maximise your ROI with social media ads. In this episode, we're going to uncover the essentials that make a good paid social campaign. Today, we'll dive into the strategies you need to know to take your social media marketing to the next level. Joining me on today's pod is our CEO, Matt Janaway, our digital marketing assistant, Charlie Kinsella, and our creative director, Tom Haslam. How are we doing, guys? Good, thanks. I'm yeah. good. Yeah, how are you, Till? Yeah, good, thank you. Nice. How are you, Charlotte? <laughs> good. <laughs> Charlie's first episode. Yeah. Usually behind the cameras or the editing. Mm. Are you excited? I'm nervous. Oh, yeah. What are you nervous, nervous. about? I don't know. You don't need really to be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to edit that out, though. <laughs> no, you're not. You're keeping that in. So paid social then, which covers a lot of different channels like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. What would you say are the key differences when it comes to um, thinking about running socials on those? Big one. Depends on the target audience, really. Obviously, if you are going B2C then I would probably suggest Facebook, Instagram, or Meta. If you are B2B, then probably LinkedIn. But it all comes down to what the campaign is, who you're trying to target, when, and what the campaign is, really. If there's evergreen campaigns, then you can probably structure your campaigns to suit. But I think it's all about understanding your audiences more than anything, to be honest. Yeah, it's key to getting social to work well, isn't it? Mm. Knowing where your audience hangs out knowing what kind of behaviours they have. If you're a ladder seller, TikTok probably isn't the platform for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ladders. It might be. Yeah, it, yeah <laughs> m- maybe, but you you got to yeah. be careful about where you put your budget, haven't you, basically? So, you, yeah, and, and, and also I think B2B is difficult mm. on social anyway often because you've just got to really make sure your audience is, is there and LinkedIn is the only real place to do that properly, isn't it? The problem that you've got with paid social is that there's no intent there. So unlike PPC campaigns with Google or Bing ads, people are actually searching for something to answer a specific question or they're searching for a specific product. With social media, we've all been there where we're sort of scrolling through our phones and we see ads. But majority of those, I will put my money on it that they are retargeting you via the Facebook pixel. So you've obviously been to their site or you might have... I don't know, been to a similar site and they're retargeting you that way. And that is a, the most powerful sort of tool that meta ads can can provide is the retargeting. We've all been there and we might have been to different sites and things and you get you get an ad. So the thing about social media, you're right, there's no intent like there would be in search marketing. People aren't searching for specific things. They're there to engage with their friends, their family, um, maybe celebrities they follow, that kind of thing. So you've got to make sure that what you're offering and what you're advertising is more impulse or awareness. So that's why it's so important to match the audience type to the platform. Absolutely. Does that impact click-through rates on social? So on, on paid socials, you're lucky if you get like a an average of a 1% click-through rate. So it means that your ads really do need to be quite targeted and you need to be well, targeting the right people, whether that's through for an awareness campaign, a traffic campaign, because your click-through rates aren't as high as PPC campaigns tend to be, then you need to make them as, as super laser target, targeted as they can be. So, Yeah, because on, on search ads, really, you, you want a click-through rate of, at least if you're getting good visibility, you want a click-through rate of anywhere from 3% to 20 maybe even 30 percent sometimes especially for for very specific things where the competition's low like uh branded uh campaigns 
And that comes down to the intent again. There's intent when people search, whereas on social, there's no intent. They're there to in, to chat to their friends or to see what their family are up to. So how would you go about determining your target audience? And is it different on different social channels? I think my answer to that question would be it depends on the ad objective. So are you looking to drive traffic? Are you looking to build awareness? Are you looking to drive conversions? Because the the targeted audiences that you use for all of those are going to be very different. So for an awareness campaign, let's say you've got a new product that you're launching and it's you go into a completely new audience, then you want to target specific people, ages, demographics. You can go broad, like you could test. That's an important thing to note. You mm. test with different audiences, at least initially, and then super sort of narrow it down as you go along. Start broad, have a broad audience, then have a sort of semi-road audience than then a really targeted one so by that i mean for example your super targeted one could be as far as women aged 30 in basingstoke i don't know where that came from <laughs> and then your broad one could be 18 to 60 year olds across the whole of the uk male and female mm -hmm. with interests in sport gym etc mm -hmm. whatever you want to target this there's, there's quite it, I'll give it to Facebook or Meta. There, there are some decent targeting sort of um, criteria that you can put into your ads. So it is quite useful. Mm. Mm. I think as well, I mean, most businesses should be aware. You'd like to think of who, what their ICP is, what their that profile looks like. So that helps. It gives you a head start, doesn't it? At least to understand um, who might perform best when, when you display those ads to them. The other thing that probably should be used is Google Analytics. So you could extract all of your converted uh, visitors in analytics and get an idea of what that demographic looks like. That's always useful as well. Because mm. you can obviously do things like A-B testing on Google ads. How does it compare with social ads? And can you do that on there as well? Yeah, you can A-B test within Meta um, directly. There's, there's a number of different ways you can do it. I tend to do it by segmenting the audiences and then trialing different creatives. And then obviously... As the campaign goes on, you can you tend to get a good idea of which creatives are working and which aren't, and then you turn them off mid-month and then review it at the end of the month, for example, and then say, right, those three creatives out of the ten were by far the best. So then the next month you just use those three. Mm -hmm. And then maybe add some more into the mix later down the line because it's good to keep it fresh as well. Like it's you don't want to get ad fatigue, mm. but then you also want to keep things fresh. So it's good to test different creatives, different audiences all the time. Are there any common mistakes that people might make when they're setting up ads on socials? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one is <clears throat> they'll not retarget properly. Mm. The, the most crucial thing for retargeting is obviously, first of all, via the pixel. So by that, what I mean, you would install the pixel on your website and then... Facebook can then track the people that have visited the website or specific pages. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example. We've got a client called Arton Heating. They're based in Kent. And we set a campaign up to promote their boiler installations offer. So by that, what we did, we targeted people, obviously in their area, which goes without saying, and specifically people who had visited the boiler install page within the last 30 days. So by that, that means that you are retargeting people that are active because it's in the last 30 days. You can go up to 180 days in, in meta. So that just allows it to be a bit more targeted on that sort of, mm -hmm. let's say, t audience. So yeah. Do you know what I, the thing that um, I see, it's very common and I think it completely gets in the way of determining performance for social is vanity metrics. Mm. The classic combination of vanity metrics in any digital marketing is likes and engagement. Yeah. And actually, that doesn't always determine whether a social ad is working well or not. And, and I think it's a difficult mindset sometimes for businesses to get out of is, oh, this advert might be working because we've had likes or we've had comments, mm. but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's doing a good job, of, depending on what job it's supposed to do. Mm. And if that engagement is what you want, then that's fine. But if you've got actual real commercial um, goals, it's probably not best thinking about vanity metrics. 
I tend to find the engagement objective quite poor, to be honest, in mm. meta. It's not great. There are better ad objectives there. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to social ads as a whole, would you say that it works better for specific industries? Because like you mentioned, Artin, and they're a, a plumbing and heating business. Um, and obviously they're selling a service as opposed to selling an actual product, whether it's, you know, you go on Facebook and you might see clothing items from different brands that you're more likely to see and go, oh, I'll, I'll buy it sort of straight away. So would you say it works better for businesses that are selling a, a, a physical product as opposed to a service? Good question. Mm. I would say it is considerably easier, to be honest, to um, use Facebook or Meta ads for e-commerce websites. Especially something that's sexy. Yeah. If And when I say sexy, I don't mean like in a sexy way, but if it's something, people, <laughs> if it's something people care about, yeah. Then, then yeah, for sure. Cl- clothing is always a good one, mm. but tech, a lot, any, anything that's maybe... Um, Aspirational or, or or very lifestyley yeah. tends to work quite well. We've we've seen really good performance from clients where we've done um, meta ads campaigns where they've got an actual physical store because there's loads of opportunity to put products into specific collections and market them and create different campaigns around them. Um, obviously, majority of the time when you've got an e-commerce store as well, you can be very seasonal. Like now, it's Halloween, for example. We've got Christmas. Black Friday. So those kind of offers do work really well on social as well, especially from a retargeting perspective. I'd say for driving traffic, social's okay. Um, For building awareness, it's great. But for retargeting, it's awesome. It's really good for retargeting. And the, the most important thing within all of that is get data into it. So use client lists. I've talked to you about this quite a bit, to be honest. And but segment them as well. So you might have different sort of segments of your client lists. Um, it's probably worth highlighting as well. So the, there are pros and cons of different platforms, but also social where it fits into the marketing mix. So um, Tom just said there, social's great for awareness, for raising awareness. That's something that actually is very difficult to do in search. You can't really raise awareness in search. Okay, you could use Google Display Ads, slightly different to search. Um but social's fantastic for that. Uh, and, and it's great for, as Tom says, remarketing, retargeting, however you want to describe it. Whereas search, search does almost the opposite thing because it's intent-driven. You're, it's, it's not very good at creating demand. It's about capturing demand, whereas social's great for creating demand. So if you imagine you've got it in a, a full multi-channel strategy, paid social, SEO, PPC, it's great because you're getting all your traffic from PPC campaigns and SEO you can retarget them with your social media campaigns. So it's it just shows how important it is to have everything in, in the mix. Like if you're just doing social on its own, it's probably not going to be as powerful if you were doing all three of those things. Yeah. So it's only just one small piece of the puzzle. But like I said, client lists are really important for retargeting. It's like gold dust, that stuff. Campaign Monitor did a study and um, of the accounts that they checked out, and there was a 760% increase in performance for those that use those lists. Yeah. And, and correctly segment. So that's huge. Like, that's a massive, massive difference. So that shows you the power of segmentation and your audience. Yeah, it worries me the amount of people that just don't use customer lists. Yeah, or way too broad. Yeah. But broad has, it, has its uses sometimes. Mm. But if, you, if what you want is commercial performance, really broad is only useful for awareness. It's almost as if you have to have multiple different campaign objectives running for simultaneously. So you've got an awareness campaign running, you've got a traffic campaign running, and then you've got a conversion campaign running. Hmm. Like social media is perfect for top of the funnel and bottom of the funnel. There is a placement for sort of middle, but those two predominantly are the, are the winners. So yeah, it, it is pretty powerful in that perspective. Have you ever seen it where someone's probably gone for the completely wrong objective when they've set up socials? Or meta? Pretty much every time. <laughs> I, I'd say it's a good 70 or 80% of the time, yeah. isn't really? it? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. It's yeah. a very high high percentage of, of clients that we've dealt with who, d- don't get me wrong, some some have it really good, but I, I would say 99% of the time we can step into an account and improve it. Mm. Yeah. Just, just purely on 
audiences. But if but, but there are loads of areas where you can improve these things. Audience yeah. is a massive one. Yeah. But then also you've got the creative. Yeah. And and this is where the testing is extremely important for both. But for it's amazing how uninspiring sometimes you see the creative, or, or even amateur actually. Mm. But mm. sometimes you see it where it's quite amateur and and it doesn't really give a great perception of who you are as a brand. Mm. And I think, again, if you've got great creative, it makes such a big difference. Well, video plays a big part in that because a video, the click-through rates on video are average around 3%, mm. 4%, maybe even higher sometimes. Yeah. So to utilise video in, in meta campaigns is... Especially UGC, if you can. Oh, UGC yeah. is really good. Mm. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it just adds that that social proof doesn't yeah, it and it yeah. just really That's helps user generated people. content by the way listeners is there anything specific that you have to think about when it comes to content on different platforms sort of i think obviously very different audiences on say linkedin to instagram for example so on instagram you you need to be quite visual and engaging so video is quite powerful linkedin again like video is the the one that i think is the winner across all social media sort of campaigns that you run if you're running uh, paid social campaigns but when i'm considering a campaign i think right i need a mix of lots of different things you need some video in there some still images maybe even some gifs trialing around um there's lots that you need to consider i think it depends on the objective as well um again it's it's quite important to just consider all avenues really so speaking about audiences don't look alike audiences play a big part yeah, lookalike audiences, are, again, are really important. So for anyone that doesn't know what Facebook does, once you've imported your first party data in, in the form of a client list, you can create lookalike audiences from it. So it's as close as taking your first party data and making a, a really close duplication of it. Now, what that does is Facebook uses a percentage. So obviously 1% is really close, 10% is really broad. So again, even then you might create a 1% lookalike, you might create a 5% lookalike, and you might create a 10% test them. Majority of the time, the 1% will work the best because it's the closest to your imported data. But yeah, they're, they're so important lookalikes. Mm. Yeah, well, um, Ad Espresso uh, did a study and they their results were essentially that if, if you use first-party data to build lookalike audiences, it halves your cost per acquisition. So it halves your conversion uh, cost, basically. I think people miss a trick with lookalikes. It, it's, yeah. it's scary how many people don't create lookalike audiences. Well, but, but it's also, when you think about it, to create a lookalike audience, you need the data in the first place. And that's I think that's the challenging part for a lot of businesses is they don't have the, the technical nows, let's say, sometimes, mm. to be able to set up analytical platforms in the right way yeah. to create those audiences. Yeah, and I think that's the stumbling block. As opposed, like it's quite easy in, once you're inside Meta Ads to be able to to do that. It's mm. just having the data in the first place. I think it's important that to think that within Meta specifically, you can create custom audiences. So you might create one from the pixel for all website visitors in the last ninety days, or let's say you've got an offers page, people that have visited the offers page in the last ninety days. You create a custom audience for that. And then you can create a lookalike of it. Yep. But people miss a trick on that as well. Like you can create yeah. lookalikes for everything. Mm -hmm. It's most powerful with first party data sure. for sure. But building it out from the the custom audience preset that you can get with Facebook is quite powerful as well. Mm -hmm. I tend to say, so for for those people that don't understand how ads are structured, you have your campaign, then you have your ad set, and then you have your ads. So I tend to segment the audiences at ad set level. So you've got maybe a lookalike audience, a retargeting audience, and then a targeting audience. And then you can put different budgets on each of them. Probably majority of your budget is going to go towards retargeting, then probably another big portion on lookalike and then targeting. Mm. I was going to ask as well, when it comes to leveraging first-party data, mm. have you found any issues with things like restrictions and stuff? Not really, because... Not when it comes to privacy. Mainly. Yeah, privacy is important. Obviously, with customer lists, you, you, you're not giving away, like, super detailed information, like addresses, telephone numbers. 
So, um, yes. So, really, so Google Analytics won't track demographics unless they've accepted cookies, provided the cookies are set up correctly. Mm. Um, so that, that sort of takes care of that part. In terms of first-party data, obviously, let's just say you're exporting all of your customers from your content management system, from your website, or from your CRM, or whatever it might be. Then, yeah, absolutely, you need, you need to be making sure that you've collected that data legally, but also that they've explicitly... Um, approved of you using that data mm. so that does pose a, a, a potential legal risk yeah and you when you import in your customer list as well you only really need to give facebook one main identifier email address phone number first name or surname email address is a good one because it links with the account but you can also hash the the data out as well so that facebook can't actually reshare it if that makes sense so normally nine times out of ten your main identifier would be an email then you might put a surname in and then city or country and then the date of birth and if you can put gender and age in it's good but you don't need to that one main identifier if you just had the one email address you can get away with that and you could create some decent lists from that but yeah you've got to make sure that in your sort of gathering that data that you can then reuse it Mm -hmm. it's, it's really important to mention i think now as well it it's not an assumed use of that data it's an explicit use so you can't just say well they're a customer i can use it that's that's not enough it has to be that they've explicitly suggested you can use it mm. um so it is worth checking that before using that kind of data mm. we mentioned budgets briefly um how would you go about determining the budget for paid campaigns it's a tough question because We've seen some really good performance from campaigns that we've run with considerably low budget, but there is a ceiling mm. with that, and you will hit that ceiling pretty quick. Obviously, you can put daily budgets in there with Facebook, so you can allocate a specific budget per day, or you can put what's called a lifetime budget in there. So from the first of the month to the 31st of the month, you might put 500 quid, mm. and then Facebook will sort of chuck money in as and when it thinks is the right mm. time. You can then add schedule so it only shows your ads at a specific times so you can be more precise with it. But it's it's tough to say. You can you can get away with a, a monthly sort of budget of 200 to 300 quid. You can still mm. get some decent performance. But it depends what it is you need the campaign to do. I think it depends whether it's a new uh, project or if it's something that you've already had running or tried before. So if you've never ran any of these social ads, it's a bit harder to decide how much budget you should have for it. Mm. If you have historic data, though, actually, it's probably a bit easier because you can start from the point of saying, well, what, what am I trying to achieve? If you're trying to achieve, for example, a certain amount of revenue generated and you can see that historically you generated a certain amount of revenue for a certain amount of cost, that you've got an idea roughly of what you need to spend to achieve it. Um, if you don't have any of that, I still think it's quite important to start from what the goal is, though. So what are you trying to achieve? Um, and then aligning it with um, with a test campaign of, of and, and see how it forms to see how you can achieve that. Um, testing as well is really important to note. I think almost every account should always have an allocation for testing. It's very easy to get to a point where you've just got things running that that are performing. But in order to get there, you've got to do the testing first because not everything will work. So, yeah, I think it's quite important that there's a certain part of a budget that is there just for testing. Mm -hmm. Would you perhaps approach it where you incrementally increase the budget like you would on Google Ads and see where, you know, the return kind of levels off? Especially if there is a good return. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. We, we've seen it before, haven't we, where the return might be six, seven times and actually it only needs to be free yeah at that point actually it's quite it's quite a good opportunity because you can keep scaling that naturally over time that return on advertising spend will probably come down a bit the more you spend but if you can bring in more revenue and actually that return on investment stays above where it needs to be then yeah absolutely mm -hmm. it makes sense to just keep spending doesn't it really in that yeah. sense um how would you go <clears> about <throat> optimizing your bid strategy then um to try and maximize your return well i would do that via audience really start off putting the majority of your budget towards the retargeting one and then a little bit towards lookalike and then a little bit towards target if you haven't got as much budget to even segment that far maybe even combine all your audiences 
it's not ideal because you can't track which one specifically does better than the other, but at least then that's what I've done with a lot of campaigns before where the budget is not high. I've combined the audience all together. So in one audience, you've got all the people you're retargeting, you've got your lookalikes and you've got your targets all in one. Mm -hmm. It's a good way. I think as well, you know, it's, it's probably important while you're thinking about budgets to also think about how you're going to analyze this. Because if, if you've set your goal and you've set your budget, you need to know what's working and why it's working and how it's working. And one of a really common mistake that I see all the time, especially this is more of an issue on social than anything else. If any form of that jigsaw, that advertising sort of conundrum that you're trying to piece together, if any form of that is on awareness, that process can take a long time to really start benefiting. Once you gain more affinity with your brand and more awareness of your brand, that's going to increase the return on investment of all of your campaigns. But that isn't something that happens overnight. So if if there's a chunk of spend that goes to awareness, you've got to have reasonable expectations of how long that takes. When it comes to budgets, would you say that smaller businesses ever have a real shot at competing with larger businesses? Not really, in all in honesty. In terms of visibility and stuff, no. It's hard, isn't mm, it? It's hard because... It, it ultimately, let's say for an awareness campaign, it comes down to impressions. Mm -hmm. So how many times is your ad going to be seen by people on screen? The other challenge as well with that is y you're not just fighting against your competitors on social. You're fighting it for your audience. Yeah. And that makes it harder to, to gain that awareness. So, for example, uh, just really, really rough example, but let's just say you want a nail bar. Um, your audience is almost certainly going to be identical to someone that runs a hairdresser. Mm -hmm. So they're not in competition at all, but they are for the audience. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that makes it extremely difficult on lo very low budgets. I would say on lower budgets, it might be better going th for intent-driven marketing like search because you can you can just make sure you pick up some crumbs on some specific keywords mm. and, and maybe in a small local area. Mm. I think that generally would work better for small budgets. Mm -hmm. Say you had a client and they sold sort of either toys or products that were kind of aimed for a younger demographic and you were setting up a social ad for them because unlike things like Facebook you can you know be on Facebook from 13 and we always see that people are on there from a lot younger if you were to set it up would you have to make the visual appealing to a younger audience but then maybe change the copy you know, if there's a deal or something to attract the parents, especially like around Christmas and Black Friday and things like that. Yeah, you'd, you'd probably target the parent in all honesty. Mm -hmm. So you'd tailor your creatives to, to appeal to them. Obviously, if it's offer-based and they're going to save money, then that needs to be the main CTA in your creative. Yeah. But yeah, certainly target the parent as opposed to the child or the kid. What I would do in that instance is target the parents through social but I'd create demand through something like YouTube video ads. Yeah. And uh, you could target specific channels or specific audiences and you get the kids aware of the product that way. Yeah. Um, which almost sounds a bit immoral, doesn't it? But, <laughs> um, but, but the, you know, kids' toys is a massive market mm. and you've got to make the kids aware, otherwise the parents won't care. So, yeah, I'd, I'd go something like YouTube display and then also maybe target the parents on social and build some awareness that way. You never know how it's going to work, but it might be a case of kids watching a YouTube video. Mm. They get an ad, they see it, oh, that looks great. Yeah. Show them mum. Mum yeah. might then visit the website. Oh, I'm not getting that. There are no offers on. Black exactly. Friday comes round, yeah. they've been retargeted. Yeah. yeah. Bish, bash, bosh. Yeah. I suppose as well, I think, like it used to be more, you'd see something on adverts and then you'd ask your parents and they'd be aware of it that way. But I feel like now more younger people don't, you know, they're not watching TV with adverts. They're watching things like Netflix that yeah. have you haven't got that option, so you've got to kind of find it somewhere else. Yeah, it's games, you know, gaming, yeah. um, it's YouTube, it's TikTok, things like that. So, again, you, you can you can target them that way. So, I, but, but I think the purchase would almost certainly be the parent, mm. so you've got to find a way of then tying that in. This is almost like the perfect time to say why paid social is, is not great as a standalone marketing channel. It needs to be used with all the others, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, you, you can use it as a standalone, but it's just more powerful when you use it in the yeah. mix with the others. I know yeah. I've mentioned it before, but there's there's lots of different ways that you can really utilise your social media ads. Mm -hmm. Going back to the adults um, thing as well, there was a study that found that 71% of adults use social media. Really? And they're probably going to mm. 
going to be a real tool if you want to shop for kids and things. Yeah, absolutely. Also, there's so many things that relate to kids outside of toys. So anything toy related, really, it's probably the parent, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, or yeah. Cl- even clothes and things like that, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anything really until they reach a certain age. Yeah, yeah. What kind of metrics would you say are the most important to be looking at when you're measuring the success of your campaigns? Likes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not likes. I'll tell you the one that is the most important, ROAS. Mm-hmm. Simple yeah. as. Yeah. Uh, apart from maybe an awareness campaign, because yeah. it's, yeah. it's going to be so long before you, you understand when that converts and it would fall off yeah. the yeah. tracking data. But yeah, I agree. If it's an awareness campaign, impressions mm-hmm. and traffic. If it's a traffic campaign, visits to the website or mm-hmm. link clicks or and things like that. If it's a conversion or sales objective campaign, ROAS. Mm. You can't always do ROAS for like a B2B business. It's it's tough to track that. You can track things by putting in custom conversions and things like form submissions, um, phone calls, and put a rough value on that and say, look, we've generated X amount of calls via ads. We've generated X amount of form submissions via ads. It's equated to a rough estimate of X, and that's how you work your ROAS out. If one of the goals as well is is building demand... There are ways you could analyse that outside of return on advertising spend as well, I guess. So let's just say you've got a new product. Um, there's no awareness whatsoever for this product. You could monitor things like search volumes for related keywords specifically about that product. That wouldn't necessarily turn into revenue directly, but at the same point you can at least determine that you're, you, you are creating demand for that product. You can directly track, obviously, purchases as well mm. via... Um meta it's worth noting that obviously cookie policies and things hold some of that information back so it's not as accurate as say analytics would be Mm. but if you've got both yeah and and, and also meta generally uh analyzes uh view through as opposed to click through yeah which is slightly different there's no point going into this on this podcast but Ultimately, if someone sees your ad, Facebook assumes responsibility for that conversion, but actually they might not necessarily have seen the ad. They haven't necessarily clicked the ad and converted. They might have seen it. So it's best to use something else to gather your data. In my, like The data in, in, in meta ads is extremely useful, obviously, but for conversion and ROAS data, I think it's sometimes best to look at it from both the perspective of the data inside Meta, but also maybe something like Google Analytics, Mm -hmm. just to try and get a better picture. Are there any trends unfolding um, when it comes to the future of paid socials? TikTok shop. I think it's already started, but I think that's growing. It's also really annoying. What about um, trends with influencers and things like that? Influencers are one of them that actually do work. I mean, in certain industries and things, they work better than others. Mm. But, yeah, influencers can be quite powerful, to be honest. I think there's definitely a trend in using more specific micro influencers now. Yeah. Mm. The, the, for a long time, people were just desperate for big audience, and the problem with that is when you have a big audience, you can demand quite a large fee. Mm. Whereas micro influencers are generally quite happy with a product to review or, yeah. or you know, something that's um, maybe a fee, but a small fee, a more yeah. reasonable. But also their audiences are much more engaged and specific. Yeah, sometimes you get people with, I don't know, maybe five to 10,000 followers getting yeah. sent free stuff and they're simply just happy with the free stuff that they'll then promote and yeah. it doesn't yeah. really cost the business anything, does it? Yeah, that's, that's more powerful than someone who you're paying to do it because like I've seen I've seen them when they're on the ads and they don't really understand the product. No, no. They're, they're reading the label can, as they're on the video, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, you say, oh, this, yeah. is, this is fantastic, it's got collagen 450c <laughs> in it and it's going to make you smell like roses but but also you um i i I think there's this weird um behavior that's grown over the last i don't know maybe three or four years maybe 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 around covid time and i actually don't think consumers now trust influencers at all Mm. Mm. Like big, whereas micro influencers and smaller ones, there's still an element of trust there. Yeah, definitely. They're, they're more authentic and genuine. And I, th- I think it probably is COVID that maybe started that process a little bit um, because there's like an automatic assumption now that you see someone with hundreds of thousands of um, followers or millions potentially, yeah. and you know that when they talk about a product, it's just an advert. Yeah. Mm. 
And it's an advert you don't particularly want to see, usually. So, yeah, yeah it's. I, I think that's one of the reasons why why micro-influencers tends to work a bit better. It's got to be the right influencer, though, hasn't it? That's yeah. that's the key, again. Similar to the audiences, it's got to the be one, the right one. The one that annoyed me the most was, like, when people jumped on the Love Islanders. Yeah. When they come out of the villa. The amount of them like... that they, they all start a clothing brand, and it's yeah. like... And, and you never see any of them again. Mm. And it's like there's just... That epitomizes that lack of trust, I think. I'm not saying it doesn't work, by the way. Yeah. Because some sometimes it can work. The thing, thing is that's a sad thing. I think it does work for yeah. the for the brands. Yeah. Because the but they'll they'll not be getting audiences that are gonna last. No. In well, my it's a flash opinion. in a pan. Yeah. 100%. That they're forgotten about within six months, usually yeah. at least. Mm. And and it's quite a sad um it's quite a sad state for marketing, I think, because I almost get the impression that that is actually what they want. They want to build an audience and become an influencer. Like it's it's a thing now, isn't it? Where kids will say, "Yeah, I want to be an influencer," mm. and it's like they want to be an influencer for the fame and for the, I guess, money and freebies. But that won't last forever because the moment businesses really start realizing that they're not getting a good return from that kind of influencer campaign, it's just going to stop and dry up. People mm. will stop doing it. A bit like they did with um, magazine adverts. So it's, it's a similar-ish thing, really. The psychology of people changes very quickly. Part of this pod that I think could be quite useful, why don't we all go round and say a brand or an ad that we don't actually mind seeing when, we, when we're going on our socials that we like? Um, Sonos. Sonos, yeah. I, I, I like a good Sonos ad. Mm. Um, I quite like some tech ads as well. I, I'm a tackle tart, aren't DJI. I? DJI. Uh, D, uh, do you know what? I haven't seen that many DJI ads on social. Have you? Mm. I've seen a couple. Have you? Yeah. Okay. They're not heavy on social ads, though. I don't. No, think. no. I would. I wouldn't mind seeing DJI ads. Um, uh, tech. Tech. Uh, yeah, mine would be yeah. Trainers to things like Foot Locker come up on Instagram quite a lot. Oh, that's um, interesting. I don't think I've ever had a Foot Locker. Mine are quite niche brands, you know, like Loki. <laughs> 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 or, or just. Nike, just, yeah. I get targeted by all those kind of ones. Mm. Um, also, like really small sustainability brands, I get targeted at. Oh, okay. Um, so things like sustainable deodorant, sustainable like mm. hair stuff, beauty products, things like that. Mm, that's interesting. Mm. I'm always looking at little things I can change. So yeah, I find those quite helpful. I get a lot of Kickstarter ones, you know. Yeah, you because you, you've been on Kickstarter yeah, quite it is. a lot, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, I I probably match their one percent audience. In yeah, fairness. probably. Um, and I do go on there quite a lot. I, I don't very rarely buy from Kickstarter, though, you know. Mm. But I, I do. Re I also really like to see the new new ideas and cool stuff. So yeah, it's probably not that cost effective. One for me, without a shock, is guitar stuff and music <laughs> stuff. Oh, is, there's a, there's yeah, a brand okay. that that keeps popping up for me all the time, and I'm so close to like just like wanting one of their guitars. They're not a very well known guitar brand. I think they're actually American, but some of their guitars look so cool. They're called Baum. B A U M, Baum guitars. Okay. But some of the ads that they put together are, are really good. And then obviously Spark. I bought a Spark amp, which was like a, an interactive light amp where you can link it with an app on your phone to get loads of different tones. Every time they bring out a new product, I'm retargeted. <laughs> it's like, buy this amp. I'm all, I'm all right okay. for an amp at the minute. But yeah, anyway. Music. About you, Shaz? I don't know, you know, because I. I don't know whether I'm a marketer's dream or nightmare, but I click every ad that I ever see. <laughs> it's, just, it's pure curiosity, even if it's completely yeah. irrelevant. Like I've just, but I, but then I find like if you click things and then you, you know, a week later I get an ad for the same company and then it starts annoying me and I think well I'm doing it to myself. Mm -hmm. But it's you like most of mine I think are clothes, trainers, new I, look. No, not really. <laughs> they come up on my Facebook a lot, and Do it they? really irritates yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so or not... like beauty products, like yeah, just basically any generic. Look woman fantastic! Product. Look fantastic! Yeah. Is a big one for me that I love. I'm like, yeah, I love that. Well, Beauty Bay, I get that all the time. Cult Beauty as well. Yeah. I bet the al algorithms struggle to determine what, how you fit into lookalike audiences mm. if you click every ad. Because I just, <laughs> the thing is, it's just curiosity. Because I think, oh, what's, what is it? But I don't like. Well, I. I often buy from like ads on like Instagram and things, but I don't tend to. If it's something completely rogue, I just I will sit and read through and like mm. learn about what it is, but I won't necessarily purchase it. So what's interesting about that is I reckon 
that because they're struggling to figure out what because you engage with it all but you're not buying a lot of it mm. i reckon the algorithms probably just default you back to like a generalized okay you're a you're a female under the age of 20 20 or whatever yeah and because they're going to really struggle to see that engagement mm. aren't they mm. how are you behaving <laughs> how are you behaving <laughs> <laughs> so you're getting shit ads. Do you know what? If you stop clicking on all of them, over time you might start seeing some cool stuff yeah. that you might like. Bring it back a bit, Shaz. Just going back to future trends and things, have you seen any um, uplift in AI automation when it comes to social ads? Yeah, mostly quite bad ones as well. Do, do you know what? There's a lot of AI creative generation, and I think you can spot it a mile away. I think it looks really bad. You can. And and I, that's just people being lazy, in my mm. opinion. But certainly the use of AI for creating ad copy and things can be quite handy. Yeah. You, you could you could easily pump in what kind of copy you think might work and say, can you improve this? And it's all about the input. So telling your target audiences, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so on. We we all know how to get the better better AI outputs. Well, Facebook have got just to, just to put in there. Facebook have got it built in now mm. to the primary text. Yeah. So if you put your own version of the primary text for the ad together, they've got a, a a sort of functionality in mm. there where you can sort of click create me five different AI variations of that. Yep. Some of them are really naff, but mm. you there might be a couple in there that you could use. Just on that note, actually, this is a common mistake that um, we've seen before. Facebook will automatically select allow AI to adjust the ad. Yeah. So you might get, we've had it before where someone's come to us and they've said, I've created this ad. But for some reason, it's saying this. And it's because they've not unticked the allow Facebook or Meta to play around with the ad. So that's yeah. really important to untick, actually, if you don't want Meta to control what that ad looks like. It's the AI enhancement. That's right. It's like mm. a, a tick <clears throat> box, and it's really small. And in some cases, it actually makes no sense. Yeah. Like you see the, the ad and you think, well, what, what's that even mean? Like that's dreadful. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd recommend giving an eye out for that and unticking it. But on on the case of AI, we're also building something at the moment. Josh is building something that um, could be really helpful with both organic and ads social. So keep an eye out for that. Sounds nice. very mysterious. <laughs> it is a little bit, but we're, we're working on something that will bring in a huge amount of information, be able to expand on it, segment it, and give you either ideation or content calendars, things like that. So Exciting. Nice. Yep. That's all for today's episode on paid social media. Thanks to the ML team for sharing their expertise and insights with us. Ultimately, paid social media is about testing, optimising and staying ahead of the curve. By following the strategies and tips shared in this episode, you'll be well on your way to maximising your ROI on social media ads. Don't forget to tune in next time for more marketing insights and expert advice on the Marketing Blabs podcast. See you next time. Oh,